ready to show you how to beat a big thing. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. My God, there is a sweet spirit in this place. And Lighthouse and those of you all who are watching online, I'm just going to start off this sermon by telling you the truth. I'm just going to get right to it and tell you the truth, that you will never be brave if you refuse to face anything that's ugly. That in this life, you're going to have trials and tribulations. In this life, you're going to have problems, and you cannot be brave if you only see beautiful things, if only beautiful things happen to you, you and I, the person beside you, the person in front of you, the person to the left of you, and the person to the right of you, every one of you, you're going to go through things, and let me tell you something, that you will never reach destiny without adversity. Adversity, it's like this pain, this feeling, this this mindset, these set of circumstances that are happening to you right now, and I know that there are some things that are happening to you right now in your life you didn't even ask for. Right. Isn't it a true that when you're going through things that are the results of decisions you made, you can kind of say, you know what, I, I, I had that coming. But, but what do you do when life smacks you from an angle you didn't invest problems in? What, what, what do you do when people you were good to are bad to you? I, I, I gave you my life and you gave me death. <laughs> and I, I gave you time and you gave me absence. I gave you my heart and you broke it. And I specifically told you when we met that I couldn't take another hurt. But you, you were so in tune with getting what you wanted that you forgot to give me what I needed. Have you ever had a pain so deep, a giant so big, a pain so prevalent that you couldn't even see yourself outside of the problem? That you thought the problem would be forever, so you, you never, you didn't try to solve the problem. You just started to learn to live with it. You started to just exist. You just, you just went through life and never let life go through you. You, you. you went through pain and you just thought that pain was your portion. And, and you just thought that you would always be small and the problem would always be big. And as opposed to trying to figure out how to solve the problem, you just decided as long as all of these other areas of my life are okay, I can deal with deficiency in this one area. As long as my children are healthy and as long as we have a roof over our head, I'll stay in this bad relationship because at least I don't have to figure out how to feed them. At least the rent is paid. Or, or, or have you ever been in a situation like that? I, I have. I know I have. And, I, and I, I told them this morning that this sermon is not for pretenders. This sermon is not for the Christians who want to come in church and just pretend like because you pray, everything gets answered. And, and, and just be, when you fast, everything turns around. And, and every time you go to God and pray, everything just works itself out. This sermon is for people who say, God, I've been begging you and I haven't heard from you. I've been begging you, God. I, I've, I've followed everything I know to follow. I've, I've done it when you told me to do it. I did it where you told me to do it. I think I have anyway. And yet, I still am facing these giants. But here's the word of the Lord. You, you'll never be big until you face something bigger. The size of your giant shows you the size of your destiny. If you fight small things, it's because you have a small future. If you're fighting a big thing, it's because God's trying to stretch you to be able to fit the garments of your future. How many of y'all are being stretched in here today? Stretched at the job. Stretched in your relationship. Stretched at home. Stretched in traffic. Just, just being stretched. Life, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing more than a cyclical rotation of adversity and prosperity. Prosperity and adversity follow each other like day and night, like winter and summer. Every day you're going to go around. It's going to be up sometimes and down sometimes. You're going to be happy sometimes. You're going to be frustrated sometimes. You're going to understand some things and some things you're not going to understand. And let me tell you, life is not about getting an understanding. So many people miss out on the point in life because every time they get hurt, they want to know why. They want to know why they had to go through this. God, why did you let this happen to me? And let me tell you, some things God didn't let happen, some things you chose. You have to be courageous enough to stop blaming God and start saying, I picked my pain. Do I have anybody in here today?
Adversity, prosperity. Prosperity, adversity. Happy, sad. Little money in the pocket, no money in the pocket. Single, with somebody, I don't know. <laughs> it's just, it's always happy, sad. Conquer the world, world's conquering me. Ready to take on everything, not, not enough energy to get out of the bed. Ready to go to church and get in ministry, I don't feel like going today. Ready to go to work, get a job, get a promotion. I can't stand my job. I don't like nobody at it. I want a new job. Oh, I thank God for the job I got. Oh, I spoke too soon. <laughs> it's, just, it's just, oh, I can't wait to get that new car. And you get that new car and you drive it about six months and now you're looking out your window at the next one you want. It's just life. Sometimes you feel good. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you love your spouse. Other times, you love them. <laughs> Y'all remember the old saying, it used to be in a church either in a storm, just come out of a storm, on your, on your way. That's why you should never relax. Either it's raining, just finished raining, or about to rain. And until you recognize that the rain is always hovering somewhere over your life, listen, it will always rain before you rain. Somebody got it. Who got it? Raise your hand if you, put your hand, be honest, raise your hand if you don't have no idea what I'm talking about. Good, okay. It will always R-A-I-N before it R-E-I-G-N. In other words, it will always rain before you rain. In other words, God always let it come from the top before you get there. God always lets the rain come. The rain is the prerequisite for raining. In other words, it's going to storm in your life, and it's going to lighten, and it's going to thunder, and, and you're going you're gonna to lose some jobs, and they're going to take some apartments, and they're going to take some cars, and some relationships are going to end, and that's just the way it is because if you don't go through anything, you'll never go to anything. God is building a strength in your struggle that does not come in your success. It is when you are angry that you learn to control your temper, not when you are happy. And so people are always asking God to make them better, but God always does it in the opposite. So when you ask God to make me more patient, he sends something that works your patience, that patience may have his perfect work, and you may not want anything. In other words, God never answers your problems with solutions. He answers your problems with problems. God, that was enough. That was worth you coming here today, that God doesn't answer your problems with solutions. He answers your problems with problems. So if you got a problem, God will give you another problem so that you'll learn how to solve your current problem. And the problem with the church, and I say this, and I know y'all ain't gonna like it, but I'm gonna tell you one thing you do, you pray too much. You pray too much, you're praying over everything. I got up this morning, I asked God what kind of shoes he want me to put on. You don't gotta ask God what kind of shoes you wanna put on. Put the ones you want on. I would suggest putting the ones on that don't hurt. So you don't have to pray and ask God to forgive you for the words you're gonna say when your feet hurt. I, 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 I tell you this, that we always pray, and I told him this morning, you're asking God for a chair, and he gave you a tree. God never made chairs. He never made tables. God gives us trees. You got to make the table. You got to make the tree. Some of y'all are praying and asking God for furniture. God said, I gave you a tree, now make something out of it. And I am here to tell somebody in here today that what you're asking God for, God says, I gave you the elements and the raw materials. Now you got to make something out of it. Make something out of it. Give somebody a high five and say, make something out of it. God is not going to chop you a tree down and carve you a chair and a table and then put it in the presence of your enemies. God says, if you want a table in the presence of your enemies, I'm going to give you a tree, you make the table, and I'll provide the food. And then I'll sit the food on the table you made, and then I'll let your enemies watch, and your enemies will be made while you are making the boat, Noah. While you are making the boat and there is no rain, God says, you can make it. I'll provide you with the materials. 
that your happiness is not anybody else's responsibility and you got to stop outsourcing your happiness to somebody else talking about you made me sad I got a question if they made you sad why can't they make you happy you made a decision to be happy or sad and which means you got to do what Paul says learn to be content in whatever state you're in and I want to speak to a hundred of y'all I don't care what's going on I want you to be glad about it I don't care what's going on slap somebody and say be grateful you're going to spend the next three days, I don't know who I'm talking to, but you're going to spend Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday shouting no matter what's going on in your life. Some of y'all are going to get to work tomorrow and be mad as the devil, and you're going to smile all the way to 5 o'clock until you get out of there. Some of y'all are going to get home, and the refrigerator is going to be open, and the front door is going to be unlocked, and the garage is going to be up, and the house ain't going to be clean, and you're still going to walk in, and you're going to smile. Even while you're whooping your children, you're going to smile. You're not going to fuss at them. You're going to smile because you're going to learn to be grateful. no matter what's going on in your life. Somebody shout, be grateful. It's my new mantra. Somebody say, be grateful. Here's what Ecclesiastes 7 and, and, and 14 says. Watch this. This is what Solomon said. He said that we should in times of prosperity be happy, but in times of adversity consider that God arranges for both days so that we don't take either one for granted. The reason why God gave you a storm is because he knows that if you don't have storms, you take the sun for granted. Okay, okay, the people say, well, God makes it rain so the grass can grow. You, 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 don't, you don't think that God can make grass grow without rain? Okay, the first grass that ever came, he said, let there be. There wasn't no rain, that was a word. God does not need water to make grass grow. He gave us the rain so that we could appreciate the sunshine. And the reason why it is raining in your life is because God saw you taking your sunshine for granted. And when he saw you taking your sunshine for granted, he sent a storm so that you can go back to your first love. Help me, Paul. So that you can go back to your first love. Help me, Revelation. He says, go back to your first love where you have left him. In other words, God sends the storms because the winds will blow you in the direction that he wants you to go. That's why the Bible says when the, when the disciples were in the boat passing to the other side, the Bible says a wind came. Now, that wind can either blow you in the direction of where you're going or that wind can be what the Bible says, a contrary wind, which is not a wind that is designed to hurt you. A contrary wind is sent to blow against you to see if you want to get where you're going bad enough to fight the wind. Do I have anybody in here that will tell the devil, I'm going to do it in the face of the wind? Give your neighbor a high five and say, I'm going to do it in the face of the wind. This relationship will survive no matter how much we argue. My money is going to grow no matter how many bills I have. I'm going to be happy no matter what kind of hell I'm dealing with in my life. Why? Because I want my peace so bad that I'm not going to let the wind keep me from winning. Somebody say, I'm going to win. So you got to learn how to beat a big thing. Some of the stuff y'all crying over, this ain't no mountain, it's a molehill. You're around here crying about a hill. We're out here about to get depressed and take 12 Advils about a hill. It's not a mountain, it's a hill. The only reason why it looks big is because you're so accustomed to making your problems bigger than they are because you want sympathy. Shut up and grow up and learn to deal with what God is doing in your life. You are stronger than you've ever been. Why are you still complaining and whining? I've seen you handle bigger things than the things that you're talking about you can't handle right now. You've been through more than this. You've been, more, you've been through more than this. But the reason why some of us milk it is because we know when we come to church looking sad, somebody's going to say, what's wrong with you? Just walking in there. <laughs> walking in church. There's some people that's put on their face so somebody can ask them what's wrong with you and so that you can tell them nothing. Amen, church. You don't need sympathy. You need success. You need some wins. You don't need anybody to pat you on your back. David says, when nobody was available to do it, guess what I did? I encouraged myself in the Lord. You don't need anybody to talk to. What did the woman with the issue of blood? Nobody wanted to be around her, so she said to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Pat yourself on the back and talk to yourself. That'll work. Tell your neighbor, my new strategy is to pat myself on the back and to talk to myself. 
Now, it's going to look crazy because you're going to be like, Seth, you can do it. People are going to think you're crazy. But guess what? When that boat is built and that rain comes and you've got a structure that nobody else has, they will go from calling you crazy to asking you for a ride. And I speak in your life in this next season that every person who thought you were crazy and thought you were not going to make it, I declare God is going to use you to bless them through what they thought was stupid. <laughs> Slap your neighbor and say, I'll be stupid for a season, but I'll be blessed for a reason. So I've been through so much hell in my life, y'all, I can't even tell you it all. I've been through a lot, man. I, I have been through a lot. I have, I have, seriously, and I'm not just saying that. I've been through a lot only because, you know, when you're a pastor, you age in dog years. No, we don't. Pastors, we don't age regularly. You know, you got your problems, and then you got everybody else's problems, and then you're held to the standard that you know you can't keep. Amen, church. And then you got all these people who come to church when everything is good. You make one mistake, they go to somebody else's church. You got all of this pressure that you live under every day that as long as you're perfect in their eyes while they come in here all jacked up, you can keep them. But as long as they find out you just like them, then they go find another preacher they think is perfect until they find out that he ain't, and then they leave his church and go somewhere else. Y'all ain't got to say, man, I'm all in your face. Put that in your pipe and smoke it because I know I'm telling the truth. If some of y'all found out I wasn't as perfect as you thought I was right now, you'd be talking about, I can't learn here no more. The Lord done told me to go somewhere else. No, you just found out that I wasn't perfect, and so you're going somewhere looking for an idol and an image. I don't want to be your idol. I don't want to be your God. I am not your example. I am your preacher. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. If you want an example, look to the hills from which come with your help, and all your help comes from the Lord. I am a fool. I'm crazy. You roll up on me, I will smack you right in your face without thinking about it, and then come right to this altar and say, Lord, I'm standing in the need of prayer. And do it again after that. Watch. There were days my mama didn't know whether I was going to live or die. There were days she told me, she's like, you know what, if you keep going around this path, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. She didn't raise me the way I was acting. And you know, that's one thing about when you raise a child good. It's something about when you raise them good, they get around knuckleheads, and now they got to prove to the world that they are not like everybody else. So here I am raising a good home, got all the love that a person needs, that a mother who supported everything I did, and here I am trying to be something I am not around people that I am nothing alike. And now I'm about to throw my life away for people who don't care about their life. I remember, I remember the first time I got shot at, I was, we were on our way to Great America, and my mama told me, she said, uh, you know, you don't need to be out because I was hanging with my partners, and we was out at like 3, 4, 5 in the morning because, you know, in those days when you're young, this is the dumbest thing. I don't know why we did it, but something happened when you're young, you think not getting sleep is a good thing. <laughs> you know, when they be young, tell me, I stayed up all night. The older you get, that is a dumb thing to brag about. No, the older you get, you want to sleep. Amen, somebody. Talking about I stayed up all night. How many of y'all right now, you know you're getting old because you start yawning about 9.15 and you're like, I don't know what y'all going to do, but I got to go home because I got to get up in 12 hours. <laughs> I, I got to get up. I can't be up all night. How many, you fall asleep every movie you watch. You talking about I'm going to watch this movie and, and by the time the credits finish, you wake up and it's tomorrow. When you're young, you want to go to Miami and go to the club and stay up to 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. When you get older, you start setting everybody up. Now, look now, do I need to drive? Because I ain't going to be fooling with y'all all night. Do I need to drive? I learned five things, and, and I'm telling you, got shot at, up there trying to call myself being a gangster disciple. I'm talking about GD, right? So I'm hollering GD to some Latin kings, and they opened up fire. I said, Lord, if this is what being a gang member is about, I'm going to be in the army of the Lord. I ain't called a gang sign out since. I never will forget 
had a baseball cap on as a Chicago Bulls because I was a Bulls fan because we was winning all the championships in the 90s. Except two that came to Houston. Yeah. I remember they were shooting at us and I was running. Running. Y'all don't know nothing about rallies. Y'all have, did y'all have rallies and checkers? Oh, who know about rallies? Ooh. So we had rallies. I was running. I was running. I got in the rallies parking lot and I didn't realize it. And I got up there and the dudes that were shooting at us was in the rallies parking lot sitting on the hood of their car with the gun. And I ran into them. And I walked away from him. I said, oh, Lord, this is it. I start walking away, and I'm thinking to myself, they're going to shoot me in the back. And as I was walking, I didn't hear anything. I got around that corner, and I took off running. I got around that corner. Then when I got to my boy Leonard's house, I went to my head, and my hat was gone. And I realized that the reason why they didn't shoot me is they was looking for the dude with the hat on. And I'm telling you, for some of y'all in here, what you got on you is going to get you killed if you don't lose it. If you don't get rid of something that's on you, it's going to get you killed. Lay aside every weight that so doth easily beset you. I speak prophetically in this room that some of y'all are getting ready to lay some stuff down that you used to couldn't pick up. God says you're going to lay it down and what you are afraid of losing, God says I'm going to pick up the slack and that whenever you break free from this addiction or whenever you break free from this relationship or whenever you break free from this stronghold, God says I still got your back. And the void that you think you will have will actually be victory. I remember pulling my first gun on somebody when I was in the sixth grade. I remember we lived in the same apartment. We were in Lakeside Garden Apartments, and, and I pulled a gun on him. He looked at me. He said, so you're going to kill me? I ain't had no bullets. So I wanted him to believe I did. I had one bullet, and it was in the house. <laughs> I didn't take my bullet with me that day. And I remember my mom looked out the window, and she saw me holding the gun to this boy's face, and she screams out the window. She says, Keon! And I looked at my mother, and I put the gun up, and my sister Danielle, who's sitting right there, she ran down the steps, and we stumped that fool to death. I'm gonna tell you right now. Y'all thought the story was going in good. We stumped him. My sister jumped down them steps, and we stumped him in there. You remember that, D? <laughs> Ooh, I was a mess, Lord. Jesus, I don't know how I'm supposed to be preaching to nobody doing the stuff I did. Y'all thought I was going to say, <laughs> my mama came and the music started playing. <laughs> I put that gun up and knocked that joke upside his head and me and Danielle stumped him. I still remember his name. I ain't going to call his name. He might be watching online, but we stumped that. <laughs> Y'all remember back in the day, you had to stump him. <laughs> the sign language lady says, <laughs> stump him. <laughs> oh, Lord, help my spirit. <laughs> Did she just <laughs> I'm going to start watching her to see what she's saying about me when I'm up here speaking. She think I think she's saying I'm crazy. <laughs> Number one, if you're going to be the big thing, never fight without gaining the power of discovery. Too many people are in things and not discovering the purpose for being in them. There were two valleys in the region of Sapila, the Ajalon Valley and the Valley of Elah. Now, the first valley is the most important valley. The water source, the vegetation, the route, the hills, everything about the first valley would be ideal. The second valley is the Valley of Eli. Although it had the wheat in between the Philistines and the Israelites, it was not the best valley. It was the second best valley of the two. But why is it that you've never heard of the first valley and you know about the second valley? It is because the first valley had things. The second valley had wars. Adversity is advertisement. The only reason you know anything about Iraq, Iran, Hezbollah, all of these different places, you ain't never been, you ain't never even been close to them. 
The only reason why you know about them is because there are conflicts there. There are portions of the world right now, Benghazi, you ain't never heard of. You don't know nobody in Benghazi. But why do you know where it is? Conflict. God uses conflict as advertisement. That, that the reason the first one is not known is because it had no wars. The reason the second one is known is because the Philistines and the Israelites had four wars in the Valley of Elah. I am telling you right now, God is using your fight to get your name out. <laughs> that there will, there will be people who will never hear about you until this fight is over. That God is using your giant to make you famous. Lord, help me in this place today. I'm speaking to somebody who's, who, 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 who has a global vision. Let me see my global visionaries in here. I'm talking about people who believe that one day they're going to be calling your name on every continent. I'm talking about somebody who has a product that once you invent it, it's going to be on the shelf of every major box store in America. I'm talking about somebody who has an invention that by the time you finish this invention, it's going to solve the problems of the world. Stop having these low local visions and these small ideas and understand that God sends big giants to big people and that God is using your fight to make your name great. And let me tell you, just because you are not being discussed don't mean you won't be discovered. That I speak to every person in here right now. You're wondering if somebody else is going to get the loan, if somebody else is going to get the opportunity. God told me to tell you, no, you're going to get it. And just because nobody knows your name right now, just because nobody knows your company right now, just because your vision is not out there right now, doesn't mean that God is not going to do it. He's allowing you to fight so you can gain the strength. Because let me tell you something about a destiny. You got to fight to get it and you got to fight to keep it. Most people fight to get a thing, but they don't understand that you have to fight harder to keep it because whenever you fight to get something, the person who wanted it but didn't have the fight wants to take it from you. They'll let you knock Goliath down and then come and take the spoils. But I came to tell somebody here, you're going to have to watch, fight, and pray. And I want to speak to every person in here of destiny and vision. In order to be the big thing, you got to discover the purpose of your pain, and you got to find out why God lets you go through it, and you got to find out why you cry, and then you got to find out what makes you stop crying. I was telling a group of people at a table yesterday when we were eating that what most people don't know is how to make themselves happy. They don't know what set of key indicators push their happy button and make them excited. You, you got to find out what makes you happy. Through your senses, what can you smell that will change your mood? Y'all not listening to me, but this is good. What colors can change your perspective? What foods do you eat that you feel better after you eat that than how you... And people, you know, it's like, and it's, I say this to most African-American people, I'm going to tell you how I know we don't eat right. Because food is supposed to give you energy. We get sleepy after we eat. That's how you know that you didn't eat the right thing because you got the itis. You went to bed after you ate wrong food. You ain't going to say amen. Yeah. Some of y'all going to leave here today and go to Popeye's. It's going to be good, but you're going to be asleep. What music makes you smile? Well, if I put on some Al Green, ain't nothing can happen to me. Let me tell you something. How can you mend a broken heart? How can I bring... I, when I start listening to that stuff, my whole mood changed. Well, if I put on some Whitney Houston, some Luther Vandross, if I put that on, my whole mood start changing. Then when I hear this other music that some of y'all listen to, I get depressed. Let's name some of these songs y'all like. Who said that? What they say? Who said two chains? All of it sound the same, and it just gets on my nerve. And when I hear it, I turn the radio off and just ride in silence. You know you're getting old when you just turn the radio off and just ride. How many of y'all, I don't even turn the music on. And let me tell you how else you know you're old, just in case you don't know. When you got to turn the music down to park, you old. Tell me, hold on, I can't see. <laughs> how many of y'all that old? You turn the radio down to park. Be bagging up, talking about. You. 
Somebody say discover. We would not have known Joseph. He was not in the pit. We would not know Moses had he not been left in the river. It is your pit and your river. It is your, we would have not have known Daniel if it wasn't for the lion's den. We wouldn't know the Hebrew boys if it wasn't for the fire. And I'm speaking to you right now because God is saying you're going to have to survive your fire. You're going to have to survive your river because I'm using that to get your name out there. Your pain is the promotion. God doesn't waste pain on people he doesn't want to promote. Your pain is your promotion. God doesn't waste pain on people who are not going anywhere. You're going somewhere. That's why you're hurting. But you got to discover it. Everybody say discover it. Next thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to understand the power of decision making. Some of y'all got some decisions to make. and You need to make them now. Successful people, listen, they think long and decide quick. Unsuccessful people decide quick and take forever to get out of it. Mm, I just gave you a million. I'm trying to give y'all a million dollars worth of game for $9.99. Now, if y'all would just listen, if, if you just listen, S successful people, they think about the process, process, process. Okay, should I do that? And when they make up their mind, they go. Unsuccessful people, they just make decisions quick, just, okay, I'm going to do it. And then you know it's not working, but you take forever to get out, which is why it becomes toxic to your life because anything you leave in your life too long takes root. Are y'all with me so far? So everybody say the power of decision-making. The Bible says that Goliath came out there with a sword and a shield and sheaves and a breastplate and his shins were covered up. His feet were even covered with bronze. David came out there with a little bit of old slingshot. Now, that looks real stupid to me. This guy's covered from head to toe. Oh, no. The Bible says he got hit in the forehead. So I want you to imagine that everything on Goliath was covered except this little space right here. This was the only point of entry to hurt him, and David was accurate enough to hit him in the only exposed part of his armor. Let me tell you something. Most of y'all in here, you got insurance on your car. You got renter's insurance on your apartment. You got clothes on your whole body. The only thing you don't have covered is your head. Which is why every time the devil wants to get you to lose your progress, he gives you a negative thought. And he hits you upside your head and you be on your way up the mountain and you, you are just about to get over that depression and then something happens and you can't get over it and you hold on to it and you harbor on it and you make everybody think you're over it but then you hold us hostage to what you say you're over and it is why you cannot move forward. How can you move forward when the knowledge you're using is behind you? You cannot make a tomorrow decision with yesterday's information. You cannot go forward when the only thing you think about is that which is behind. I put those things that are behind me, I press toward the mark for the prize. Of the, notice the prize is in front of you, never behind you. You've got to put the negativity behind you so that you can reach the prize. Whenever you hold the negativity, you have no hands for the prize. And you keep blaming God for not blessing you. God says, I've given you the blessing, but your hands are not empty to receive it. Because your hands are on the thing you should have forgot. Your hand is on the bad decision that you made. And I want to talk to somebody in here like me who's made a bad decision. Can I tell you? Get over it. You made it. It's over with. It's done. If you can't handle it, do something else. But if you've decided to move forward, I need every person in here to do me a favor. Stop forgiving everybody else and stop forgiving all of what they've done and can you do me a favor in 2018 can you forgive yourself can you forgive yourself for what you said for what you've done for how many times you've done it I know you want to feel like you disappointed God but can I tell you you didn't catch God by surprise God had already knew that you were messed up and he had already called you and he had already ordained you give your neighbor a high five and say God is a forgiving God 
you got to stop thinking God is like the people who always bring up your past and the people who are always keeping that stuff in front of you. God throws that stuff into the sea of forgetfulness. Somebody shout, I'm forgiven. You got to make a decision to cover your head and stop letting negativity always enter in your head because you can never have a positive outcome with negative input. You're frustrated. And it's because you got hit in the head. Every part of you was covered except for your mind. Something happens to some of you all right now. You stop coming to church three, four weeks right now. Talking about, I had to recover. <laughs> Why would you stop going to church because life happened? It seemed like to me that when you're going through all hell and high water, you run to the church. Can I just give an announcement right now? Can I give an announcement? To all of the people who think that when you sin and you're embarrassed that you want to stop coming to church, I say come. Can I go a little further? Bring your sin with you. <laughs> Bring your sin with you and then come and lay it at this altar. I wish I had somebody here today. I, I can't wait for the day that we all just admit that we all tore up from the floor up and just bring all our mess and lay it at the altar and then leave it there and just have a prayer service and say, God, I'm trying to leave this adversity at this altar. I'm trying to leave this freaky mindset at this altar. I'm trying to leave my anger at this altar. Some of y'all tell me, ooh, I know who I'm talking to. This is 11 o'clock. Wake up. Come here, look at me, somebody. Do I have anybody? I just need the real people. I told you this sermon one for the fake folk. I'm talking about the people who sometimes embarrass yourself when nobody was there but you. Bring it to the altar and leave it here and stop bringing God your garbage and then pack it up and take it back home with you. Somebody say, make a decision. Cover your head. I don't even talk to people who get on my nerve. No, I don't. People who get on my nerve, I tell them happy birthday and Merry Christmas. Whenever you got to mute somebody on the phone so they don't hear you cussing them out when you're talking to them, that's the conversation. Don't y'all make me start now. I get, I'm, I get angry and honorary when you treat me like this. When you be talking about... Yeah, I'm here. Get off of the phone. <laughs> Tell them you are messing up my destiny. Somebody told me, I said that on Instagram one day, somebody told me, they said, well, what if it's your family? I said, um, what are we talking about? You are not obligated to not be happy because you're related to them. If we relate it and you get on my nerve, I don't need to talk to you either. You're not obligated to be miserable because you relate it. You don't get to make me miserable because we cousins. So what? I got cousins I don't know and I'm still alive. <laughs> and if some of y'all ain't saying amen, you don't want making people miserable. That's why you ain't saying nothing. And I'm talking about, mm, moving on, Reverend. Moving on. <laughs> I'm sorry, Z. Somebody make a decision. Just pick. Everybody just pick. Pick. It might not be right, but pick. Who said that? Choose ye this day. Well, you are walking by, but choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You got to make a decision. Everybody say make a decision. Stop letting the devil hit you in your decision maker, stalling you into no decision because no decision makes sure you make no progress. No progress makes sure you make no advancement, and no advancement makes sure that you continue to have adversity. Number three, the power of deficiency. Every one of you with your saved Holy Ghost self you got a problem. I know you're saved, and I know you went to Sunday school. And I know you went to BTU, and I know that the Lord blessed you real good, and I know you got the Holy Ghost in your blood. I know you do. And I know that you're so saved that, you, that you, you're, you're so heaven-bound, you're no earthly good. You, you're on your way to heaven anyhow. You, you pray about everything. I know, you, I know the Lord dressed you. I know all of that, and I, and I know the Lord cooked your bacon for you. Some of y'all just swear the Lord. I didn't even cook the bacon. I just woke up, and it was on the stove. Ain't that God? 
Ooh, I can't stand them kind of people. Have you ever seen anybody that holy? They're just holy for no reason at all. Just wake up. I woke up this morning, woo, and God turned that water on. Yes, he did, and I don't know how that water came on, but it was the Holy Ghost. God don't turn no water on for you. Everything the Lord did. Look at God. The sun shining today. That means he on the throne. If it's raining, the devil beating his wife. No, it's raining. <laughs> it's raining because that's what it do when precipitation goes in the sky and the cumulus clouds accumulate. That's why it rains. Not because the devil's beating his wife. The devil has never been married. And who would do the ceremony? Who would marry the devil? Just think about that. Some of the stuff that we say. The tallest man that ever lived was named Robert Wadlow. He died at 8 feet 11 inches. 8 feet 11 inches. I'm 6'4", so let's see, 7'4", 8'4". He was almost 3 feet taller than me. Okay. He died at 8 feet 11 inches. When they measured him in his casket after he had died, he had grew another inch. He grew when he was dead. Don't ever think growth means life. Well, we're supposed to be together because we're growing. No, you can be in the dead thing and grow. <laughs> Robert Watlow died of a disease called acromegaly, which is a, a, a disease that gives a growth hormone that comes through the pituitary glands that has a side effect. And one of the side effects is, is that it has a tumor that grows around the nerve endings that lead from the brain to the eye. <laughs> I told you who I was, D. I told you. And when this tumor grows, it grows around the eye nerve and it begins to compress the eye nerve and it leaves the giant with one or two melodies. It either leaves them with blurry sight or double vision. Now I know why. I asked myself this question. I said, self, myself said, hmm? I said, self, why in the world would a man nine feet tall need an attendant to lead him down to the Valley of Eli? Then I'm recognizing that he probably had this disease, which means that Goliath had an attendant to lead him down to the valley because he could not see. Wow. No wonder the stone hit him. He didn't see it coming. He goes down to the Valley of Eli. He has a guy that takes him. I'm wondering if he's a giant. He should be bold enough to go by himself. But I now realize the same thing that made him big made him blind. That sometimes your gift can be your curse. He's big and blind. What good is it? I'd rather be able to see it and be small, David. You're trying to be big. I'm telling you, don't be blind. You don't always have to be the biggest person in the argument. Sometimes be quiet. Be small so you can see. Lord, help me. The person who always has to win is blind. The person who has to always get the last word is blind. He can't see. Same thing that made him big made him blind. See, that's why you got to be careful when you're extremely gifted because your gift will also curse you. The same drive that gives you the power to stay at work 15 hours will be the same reason you lose your family. You got to find a way to balance it. He's big and blind. Now he's so big, he needs somebody to guard him and to guide him. And he's got a deficiency. Every one of you, you better find out what your deficiency is before you fight this next battle. You ain't perfect, and you better recognize where you're not. Did you hear what I said? This is the best thing I've told you all day. The admission of your ignorance is better than the pretending of your proficiency. When you don't know something, it is okay to say, I do not know. Stop giving these dumb answers to pretend like you know everything. You ever heard somebody, they answer the question and you listen to the answer like, I know that ain't right, but I'm going to just shake my head like, okay, go ahead. Just say you don't know. <laughs> exactly. Just say you don't know. What makes you big can make you blind. What makes you good can make you bad. What makes you hot can make you cold. What makes you palatable can make you irritating. You got to be honest with yourself. Like I was telling this morning, I said, I ain't perfect, man. You know, I, I, I want to be. 
I've been trying. This ain't working. I don't want to get angry sometimes, but evil is always present. And my wife said, boy, you always got a scripture for everything. Evil is always present on every hand. I'm perplexed, but yet not in despair. <laughs> Troubled on every side. What's wrong with you? Because pretending like ain't nothing wrong with you ain't going to help you. I'm going to give you a few seconds. What's wrong with you? Because you know what's wrong with everybody else. I know that. You can always tell the other person, you know what your problem is? Your problem is you don't respect nobody. What's your problem? Why does he keep disrespecting you? What's your deficiency? See how quiet you is? What's your deficiency? Who said that? Talk too much? Okay, anybody else? What's your deficiency? Anger, patience, procrastination, attitude. Who said messy? Oh, hallelujah. That's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. They saying all this sexy stuff. Oh, I have a problem with my patience. No, they messy too. I'm, I'm girl, down with like four flats, 100 grand and all that. People all, have you ever noticed when you ever ask somebody what's wrong with you, they give you a sexy answer. Oh, I struggle with my faith. <laughs> I'm struggling with my walk with God. And if I could get my walk with God, all right, I'd be good. It's my walk. You got a stank attitude, a temper, you're evil, and you hold grudges. You're always trying to get even. You've been putting poison in the water. That's why they've been coughing for the last three weeks. <laughs> get, that, get that stuff out. Because until you admit how bad you are, you can never perform in your goodness. Number four. The power of difference. You better find out when you're fighting a big thing how different you are than anybody else in the world. The problem that most people have is they're always trying to be similar to something. I can bake cakes just like no. If you can bake cakes just like them, then they're going to keep going to them because they're already established. You need to bake cakes like you. Oh, I can, I can do this just like, no. You don't want to do anything like anybody else because nobody pays you in this world for your similarities. They pay you for your differences. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, what's different about you? I know, you are, I know you're a designer. I know you can do interior decorating, but what's different about your design? Not just color schemes. Everybody can do color schemes. What, what do you do? Do you do something with textures that other people don't do? Do you do things with fabrics? Do you have a connection that you can get a product shipped five days than somebody else? What is your difference? Because I will pay you for your difference. I will ignore you for your similarities. I met a woman one time, she could sing just like Aretha Franklin. She was just, she sound just like Aretha Franklin. She has no albums that you've ever bought. Why? Because when I want Aretha, I listen to her. What's your difference? David said, I'm small, but I'm accurate. And I can see. In the war, when the Turks were fighting the Arabs, it is suggested that 70% of the time when the larger country fights the smaller country, the larger country always wins. So if you take the last 200 wars that the world has ever seen, 70% of the time the larger country always wins. But when the smaller country changes the rules, their winning percentage goes from 30% to 65% case in point when, when America went to Vietnam. And we were way bigger than the Viet Cong, but they changed the rules and introduced something into the war atmosphere called 
Yeah, guerrilla warfare. And so now they've changed the rules, and now here we are losing to David. Right now we're fighting ISIS. ISIS doesn't have a tank. ISIS doesn't have jets. ISIS doesn't have nuclear bombs. But why are they killing us? They said, I tell you what, we won't blow you up. We'll just drive trucks through your parks. We'll wait until you gather and we'll use our cars to roll down 30 and 40 people. Or we will go, Lone Ranger, and go to a hotel and break out the window and wait until you have a concert and shoot you while you're not looking. Because when you change the rules, you can win. When you change the rules, you can make a bigger impact. And I'm not glorifying what they did. I'm just telling you, when, they don't, when people don't fight regular, they make moves and make damage and make headlines and make news. And the problem is, is you are in a routine trying to do it the way everybody else did it. Your winning percentage goes from 30% to 65% if you'll just change the game. If you'll just do something different. You can double your chances of success. Yeah. Number five, the power of doing. Can I tell you what the last thing you need to do? Something. You know how many people expect something that don't do nothing? Lord, bless me. God says, I can only bless your efforts, not your hopes. What have you given me to work with? David says, I got a rock and a rag. Yeah. Do you know how dumb that plan sound? Right. You're going to take a rock to a dude that got a sword, a shield, a breastplate, a helmet, ankle bones, shin bones. He got all of that, and you're going to take a rock? Right. Hmm. Goliath had weapons, but he didn't have a plan. Right. Yeah. David didn't have much weapon, but he had a plan. And David had been practicing with his rock and his rag. You know why he was able to kill the giant? Because he had already killed a lion with the same rock. He had already killed a bear with the same method. See, if you kill your lion and you kill your bear, then you can face your giant. But it is hard to leave your lion and bear alive while facing your giant because the lion and bear will eat you for leaving them alive. I'm done. But I want to leave you with this. What are you doing that God can use to achieve the dreams that you say you want? You got to do something. Hey, lazy don't work, man. That's, this is one thing that I've seen. There's more lazy people in the world than I've ever seen in my life right now. Everybody wants something for nothing. You can't be lazy. You can be flawed, but you can't be lazy. You can make mistakes, but you cannot be lazy. The only people I want to stand right now is you say, God, you're giving me a few more weeks left in this year, and I'm going to do something with what you gave me. If you're going to do something, I want you to stand up. If you're going to do something, not hope and pray and fast and all that, that's good. We're going to do that after we get it. We're going to do something. How do you beat a big thing? Scan has completed. It's completed. You, you got to make sure that you have the mind to make a decision. Some of y'all have decisions in limbo right now. You don't want to make a choice because you don't want to upset nobody. Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to offend anybody. You will never be successful without offending somebody. You're going to be offensive. Everybody say you're going to be offensive. You don't have to do it intentionally. Don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant. Don't be mean. Don't be vengeful but be on purpose. And if they get offended because you have a dream, too bad. Go after it anyway. You're going to have some deficiencies. You